This diagram represents the so-called eternal triangle or three-legged stool that describes the dilemma of the healthcare system in this country today. You need all three sides to complete the triangle, all three legs to hold up a stool. The trick is determining how to improve one of the three without damaging the other two. We will spend a lot of time this semester learning how this juggling act has been done so far. We may even come up with some ideas to help make it work better. Costs. Healthcare spending currently accounts for around 16% of our gross domestic product. That's a number that you really need to remember. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, studies estimate that it may rise to as much as 18% or 19% by 2013. Many experts foresee a train wreck down the track when costs get this high. As costs increase, employers have begun to pass on the increases to employees called cost shifting. Because the system is so large and interdependent, a rise in costs in one area affects others in seemingly unrelated areas. For instance, the market pricing of newly patented prescription drugs results in higher costs to both consumers and to the federal government, who must reimburse prescription of drugs under Medicare Part D and Medicaid. Development of new technology creates rising costs for providers, both inpatient and outpatient, and also nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. And through, through cost shifting, this goes to the consumers who bear part of the burden. Your text refers to the concept of provider-induced demand, which is referred to in regular economics as supplier-induced demand. The text defines this in a somewhat biased manner, in my opinion, and you'll have to check the definition to see what I mean. But marketing and prescribing the latest medication or medical procedures can increase patient demand for services. There's another term that we'll come across later in the semester called the technological imperative. The idea that once new technologies such as MRIs, PET scans, non-invasive colonoscopies, and so on come on the market, we all want the latest and the best, also driving costs up. So it works both ways. This could result from either, say I go to my primary care physician and I want an MRI and I ask for an MRI. That is the technological imperative. However, if my primary care physician buys all of this new technology and then prescribes it for patients indiscriminately in order to drive up demand, then that is provider-induced demand. It works both ways. And one of the ways to see how this differs geographically is go to go to the um, Atlas of Healthcare. Uh, Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, which shows the geographical distribution of things such as facilities using MRIs, facilities prescribing uh, medication for ADHD, and you can see that in some even different census blocks there are higher rates of prescriptions of different kinds of technologies. And of course, with higher rates of prescription for the uh, prescriptions or use of these procedures, the costs are going to be driven up. So some of it is dependent on providers. Quality. Just what is healthcare quality? You might be surprised to know that no one single definition of healthcare quality exists. During the last 15 years, researchers, regulatory agencies, consumers, the federal government, and insurance companies have all begun to demand accountability for results. We will learn what all of these entities are doing to capture the concept of quality and concrete measures that can be compared between hospitals, healthcare organizations, between insurance plans, and over time, to name a few comparisons. We will learn about the move to reduce medical error, issues with information technology and interconnectivity. Access. You will see in Chapter 1 that the most accurate measure of access to health care is your insurance status, not necessarily your income. But access is so essential that the Healthy People 2010 Initiative for the United States 
and more recently the Healthy People 2020 initiative includes access to health care as one of the top 10 indicators of the health of a population. Access varies by income, race, age, geographical location, and educational level, among other factors. Elimination of these disparities in access to care is a major goal for Healthy People 2020, which you will learn more about in Chapter 2 of your text. And it's also one of the major reasons for the development of the Affordable Care Act. I want to talk for a minute about the definition of a conceptual model. In this course, I'm going to use the term conceptual model. Um, I'm going to define it as a framework for looking at complex issues that allows us to organize our thinking into categories of the whole. This iron triangle is one way of organizing our thoughts and questions. Another way is the quad function model that's included in the next mini lecture. The quad function model of healthcare delivery. It includes financing, payment, insurance, and delivery. This is another important concept that we will revisit over and over again. It's diagrammed on the next slide and on page six in your textbook. This model is important to learn. You'll find information about it throughout the text, and um, we will discuss it many times throughout the semester. The question that I would ask now for you to think about throughout the semester is whether managed care has become a fifth component of the model. And here is the quad function model, um, the diagram from your textbook. As the authors note, these functions do overlap. The function of managed care is to integrate the other four functions and to help them run smoothly and efficiently. An attempt to improve quality and access and decrease costs at the same time. We'll have plenty of discussion about whether this has worked out or not and what components of the Affordable Care Act, given that it is fully implemented, will provide this function for the future. The finance function. The financing function is different than the payment function. Those who finance health care are those who provide the actual money to pay for it, the source of the money that will be paid. Employers are not required to finance health care in this country, but many do. About 60% of the non-elderly population have employment-based health insurance. This number is decreasing as employers face rising costs for insurance. The federal government spends approximately 12 to 14% of its total budget on Medicare and around 7 to 9% on Medicaid. Medicaid is partially paid by states, with richer states paying a higher percentage than poorer states. The government also funds a number of other programs, such as the Children's Health Insurance Plans, immunizations, and other public health services. This is all part of the finance function of financing health care in this country. A small percentage, approximately 5% of individuals, are covered by private insurance. An even smaller number pay out of pocket for medical expenses. And healthcare organizations do the financing. This is something that's not often described overtly. However, in essence, hospitals and outpatient clinics finance the portion of health care that they write off as uncollectible debt. So they are the invisible financers for much of indigent care, although they do pass the costs on to their consumers. The payment function. While employers provide the money through the financing function, insurance companies and others perform the payment function. Blue Cross and Blue Shield began very differently than traditional insurance companies. Third party intermediaries such as EDS in Arkansas often process the payments for insurance companies. The government both finances and provides payment for Medicare and Medicaid services, although today they are oft often privatizing the payment function so that they may provide the financing, but a third party intermediary provides the payment. The insurance function. Although insurance companies may perform all three functions, the term insurance refers to the assumption of risk by the insurer 
in exchange for periodic premiums paid by the insured. It works like this. Individually, the probability that any one of us will occur medical expense for a catastrophic accident, for example, is very small. However, we all pay premiums to share our portion of the risk with others. Pooling our resources protects us against the risk of catastrophic events. Insurers underwrite risk. They evaluate, classify, rate, and give monetary value to risks of all kinds. This is how they know what premiums to charge for what size of population. The delivery function. In the last 30 years, a plethora of new professions have appeared in healthcare delivery. New jobs for physician assistants, pharmacy aides, sports physiotherapists, and certified nursing assistants have been some of the fastest growing careers in the country, according to the U.S. Department of Labor. The landscape of delivery has become almost unrecognizable from what it was in the early 20th century. We have tertiary care hospitals with the latest in technology outpatient or ambulatory centers where many surgeries can be done within a, out an overnight stay, and mobile dialysis units, to name a few. Managed care. There is no single model of managed care. There are many permutations. What is essential to all of these is the combination of insurance, payment, delivery, and financing functions under one integrated approach in one organization. Prior to 1983, providers charged patients on a cost plus basis called FFS or fee for service with virtually no regulation. Insurance companies reimbursed whatever the providers charged. Beginning with Medicare in 1983 and continued by managed care, Payment is now determined by the type of procedure with capitated or limited reimbursement for each procedure. This limited reimbursement was instituted to cut costs and control spiraling health care spending. Managed care also attempted to improve the quality of care by holding providers accountable and providing preventive care. Under managed care, the primary care physician acts as a gatekeeper to the specialists, thus cutting down costs by controlling access. Some might say that managed care attempted to maximize all three areas of cost, access, and quality, but was unable to succeed due to the competing priorities. And beyond managed care. Because managed care does not seem to have been successful in balancing the cost-quality-access triangle, other ideas are being floated about what comes next for the U.S. healthcare system. Consumer-driven healthcare, or CDHC, models are an attempt to put choice back in the hands of consumers. They differ from managed care in that consumers can pick and choose from a variety of different plans depending on their individual needs. Theoretically, it will cause providers to compete for consumers on the basis of price, quality, and convenience, driving costs down. Medical savings accounts substitute individual tax-free savings accounts for insurance. They are a form of consumer-driven health care. Universal coverage models, similar to Canada's, would provide health care to every American regardless of their ability to pay. There are controversies with these approaches. Most notably, CDHC proponents believe that universal coverage models will dilute quality, increase waiting times, and stifle competition in new technologies. Universal coverage advocates believe that health care is a right, not a privilege, and that CDHC models will force many Americans to choose between health care and other basic necessities. And finally, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. Rather than launch into a full explanation of the new law, I have posted two YouTube videos and one website for your enjoyment. 
Well, okay, the last one's more of a resource than for your enjoyment, but it is a valuable one with a nice timeline for when all of the provisions are set to take effect. The first video is about three minutes long, the second one is about nine minutes long, and is from the Kaiser Family Foundation, an important health policy think tank. I would love to hear your feedback on these videos. This is the last of the mini lectures for this week, the healthcare system, external forces, international comparisons, and summary and wrap up. I'm going to discuss some of the external forces that impact on how healthcare is delivered in this country. Then I have a brief summary of how to ac access the data for Assignment 1. I've posted Assignment 1 in the assignment sections of the course. We're going to have four of these over the course of the semester related to demographics, health and healthcare professionals, and so on and so forth. You should pick one county in the country and follow it all the way through using it for each assignment. It can be from any state in the union. You might even want to pick more than one for your own interests if you want to compare urban and rural, rich and poor, and so on, but that is not a requirement. No industry exists in a vacuum. This diagram from page 10 in the text illustrates outside forces that impact on health care. During the course of this semester, we will refer back to it many times. It will help us to understand and possibly to predict changes within the industry. This understanding is a crucial sixth sense for successful administrators and managers. For example, here are some current events and trends that should be on our radar screens. Social values and culture. We are becoming more and more a multicultural society with diverse ethnicities and subcultures, all of which may have different perceptions of health care and different needs. Political climate. The politics of stem cell research will have a major impact on the search for cures and the growth of the bioengineering industry. Economic conditions. Employers are paying smaller and smaller portions of health insurance for employees, responding to and creating economic conditions that determine access to health care. Technology. We constantly learn of new technology, such as RFIDs, or implanted radio frequency identification chips with health information that may be effective and useful, but raise questions about ethics and privacy. Physical environment. In 2005, we saw a powerful example of how the physical environment can devastate the healthcare sector of a major American city, New Orleans, with ripples and implications for hospitals in Houston, Little Rock, Jackson, Mississippi, and others. And finally, the population characteristics. In contrast to the situation in the 1950s when a hospital and staff were enough, administrators today must be acutely aware of the demographics, risk factors, tastes and preferences of the populations that make up their service areas. A hospital or ambulatory care center in Southern California has a much different patient base than one in the Rocky Mountains or the Mississippi Delta region. The guidelines for Assignment 1 are pretty self-explanatory and I'm going to walk you through the web pages. Um, the first database that we're going to use is from the census, USCensus.gov and we're going to go to the Quick Facts site. So that starts on the next slide. As you can see, right here in the left column, I've got a red arrow there, and I put this up in color so that you can see where I've highlighted things more easily, but you can print out the handouts in black and white if you like. Uh, you want to go to the quick, so quick Facts, and if you're interested, you might play around with using a map to pick a state or whatever. I think that once you get into the county level, you can even use the map to look at um, the demographic data and the economic data. Okay, I have skipped through the page where you select a state because I just selected Arkansas and it's going to give you this select a county button. 
and you'll see that it gives you things on population, things on race, and as you scroll down when you get to the web page, you'll see that it gives you much more information on that county. Now, what you might want to do is look at a few counties and see which one interests you. Just don't pick something you're familiar with. You might pick somewhere in New Jersey or somewhere in Washington State just to get a sense of what's going on in the rest of the country. Some good um, metropolitan statistical areas, large ones, are St. Louis, New Orleans, Chicago, uh, if you're interested in looking at urban areas. There are going to be more healthcare professionals in urban areas, as we'll see later on when we get to the other assignments. So you might want to even pick one rural and one urban, as I suggested before. But for this assignment, you only really have to find one. You can pick the city and then go back and get the county that that city is in. I neglected to point out in the previous slide that it compares the demographics for Arkansas to the country as a whole. And so when I clicked on select a county and selected Pulaski County, Arkansas, it compares Pulaski County to Arkansas as a whole. If you want to pick certain demographic variables and compare them to Arkansas and the country as a whole, you've got it all here right in front of you in just those two uh, web pages. I'm going to talk just briefly here about the three primary forms of health insurance or healthcare systems that are mentioned in your textbook. And of course, as you would expect, there are many different permutations of this in, of these main forms in many different countries. Um, so I want you to be sure that you read through this section of the textbook and look at some of the permutations among even the countries there under each of these topics. Na national health insurance and a nationalized health care system, people often get these terms mixed up. In fact, people often take all three of these terms and lump them into the idea of socialized medicine, which is kind of held up as a nightmare system that we don't want to get involved in in this country. And that's what some of the opponents of the Affordable Care Act have used as a scare tactic, the idea of socialized medicine. So anyway, the first one is national health insurance. The example that your textbook uses is Canada, in which the government assumes the financing, payment, and insurance functions although the financing is really technically accomplished by a general tax on the population. The term global budget, which you will see applied to both the national health insurance systems and national health systems, simply refers to a budget determined in advance to cover the health care needs of the population for a projected period of time, adjusting for trends over time. It's not really that different from, it's not really different at all from what insurance companies do. It's simply called a global budget because it is done for the nation as a whole. In a national health insurance system, the government does not assume the provider role. It simply reimburses both public and private providers. The Canadian health care system is sometimes held up as a model for equitable health care that reduces disparities and increases access to care. However, in recent years, the costs have increased dramatically and private insurance companies are beginning to appear. In a nationalized health care system, such as Great Britain, the government provides all functions financing through taxes, insurance, payment, and provision of health care services. However, what is often omitted in descriptions of this system is that Britain actually has a tiered system effectively, maybe not formally, but effectively it does have a tiered system with some private insurance companies and private practice physicians providing care to those who can afford it. Interestingly, even in Great Britain, with the National Health Care System or National Health Service, health care status of the population varies by social class. British birth certificates have traditionally listed the father's occupation but not the race of the child. Longitudinal studies have shown repeatedly that those with a higher class ranking by father's occupation at birth 
have better health even in adulthood. This raises the question of whether a nationalized health system can eliminate all disparities or all health disparities. It also points to the fact that whether you look at class or race or income, there is a disparity across gradients. Finally, socialized health insurance includes mandates that all citizens have coverage. However, care is provided through private provider, providers financed through sickness funds, and the example that your textbook uses is Germany. Each of these systems has significant advantages and also disadvantages. Please read the brief description in your textbook on the countries covered to get a more in-depth understanding of these variations. One of the most striking thing that I see in all of this is how many countries with varying types of healthcare systems, not just the United States, are seeing the impact of rising costs and economic recession. In conclusion, how to learn the system. Concrete facts such as numbers of hospitals, size of the workforce, types of professionals, methods of care, technology, new and old, the history of the industry. You will find that there are many, many, many facts to learn in this course, from new definitions to acronyms to rates and ratios and financial information. With careful attention, you will become an articulate insider in 13 short weeks. Some questions that will help you understand the next three components. Who is involved in running the system, if it is indeed a system? Who are the players? Who has influence? Who creates demand? Who uses the product? How does the product differ from that in other industries? Who has the power and who doesn't? The money. What is the healthcare marketplace? Does it exist as a true marketplace? What does healthcare cost? Who pays for it? Where does the money go? How does the money, the economic cycle, the insurance industry, the federal government impact on the system? What are the methods of interaction, formal and informal, between the players? What laws, regulations, lobbying activities, consumer characteristics interact to produce the system we see today? What is the impact of outside forces? Who has power and how is power shifting? Just as in learning tennis or a foreign language, as you master the pieces, the big picture will become clearer and clearer. At times, it may seem that you can't see the forest for the trees, but stick with it. Take time to reflect on these questions and your focus will broaden and deepen. That's it for this first lecture. Please email me if you have any technical problems with this lecture or if you have any questions at all.